there's a, <clears throat> a combination that has to exist. In. It's a, it, it sports, the, it's a, the, there's a self-expression, and then there's a, the discipline part of it, you know, adhering to rules, regulations. Uh, but there's also a part where the, the individual, has, there has to be some self-expression. You can't destroy that. Welcome back to the podcast. You are listening to Let It Out with me, Katie Dalebout, and happy holidays. If you're listening to this the day it comes out, we're in the midst of the holiday season. Christmas is just a few days away. Maybe you're traveling home as you're listening to this. Maybe you're not able to spend time with family this holiday season. But wherever you are, I hope you at least get a moment to pause because I think one of my favorite things about the holiday time and this time of year is that everyone seems to kind of relax and slow down a little bit. The entire world pauses for a bit, or at least it's a bit different. It's also very busy, and I know the holidays can also be very stressful, and I feel you there as well. But hopefully there's at least a pocket of time where you get to pause and just kind of reflect on the year, get ready for the new year. Anyway, either way, I hope that if you are spending time with family this year, it's full of love and laughter. That sounds cheesy, but it's true, and meaningful conversations, which is my very nice transition into today's podcast episode. So here's the thing. This week, I was scrambling for a new episode, which if you're a usual listener, you might know this, but I never do that. I usually have a lot of episodes recorded on my computer and then I just kind of choose at randomly which one I want to air this the week that it is. Anyway, this week with all of my travel and everything that I had going on, I hadn't been recording episodes for a while, so I didn't really have, it was slim pickings of, of what to choose from. So I actually found this deep cut on my old computer a conversation that was recorded in 2013, early 2013, that was just a month after I had started this podcast. And let me set the scene for you. Like I said, early 2013, I had just turned 23 years old. My podcast was still called The Wellness Wonderland Radio, which some of you might still remember. I just changed the name officially a couple months ago. But back then, I was much more one-track mind focused on health and wellness from a physical standpoint. There wasn't really much talk of creativity or relationships or anything else that I talk about constantly now. Anyway, back then, very wellness focused. I was very new at this. And you can tell that through the questions that I'm asking and the areas that I'm focusing on in this conversation. And I had no microphone. I just recorded this on my MacBook. And the guest is the oldest guest we've ever had on the podcast to date. He is a lovely 90-year-old man named Gus. And you probably won't know him. But to me, it's a legendary conversation because he is my grandpa. (laughs) And I haven't aired this because, like I said, you know, I kind of cringe at this episode, not because of my grandpa. He was lovely and delightful. But a lot of the things that I say and just me as a host, I I wasn't – I was really inexperienced, you know, I I just started this podcast and not that I've improved a ton, but hopefully I've improved at least a little bit and hopefully become a better listener and question asker. But I think I've definitely changed as a person since this podcast was recorded. And I think the podcast has changed a bit too. And I was reflecting on that change and growth, hopefully, And I thought that this would kind of be a timely week to air this particular episode with my Gramps, who you'll hear. I call him Poppy. And it it's a time to kind of reflect on 
how far I've come and how far this podcast has come and how much we change and just kind of reflect and and look back on the year. So anyway, I thought it was also relevant this week with family time and going home for the holidays that maybe it will inspire you to really talk to your grandparents or your older relatives when you're around them for the holidays perhaps or any time of the year, but really be present with them. Talk to them. Ask them real questions. Really interview them. Maybe even record it. You don't have to share it like... I'm doing, but just really think about how cool it is that old people are this time machine into the past. I was talking to my friend John when I was in Hawaii last week, and John's grandma, listen, you guys, his grandma hung out with Thomas Edison. Like, they knew each other in that sort of a way. What a cool link to history we have through old people. So just take that in. Ask your grandparents to tell you stories. And that's really all I have to say. This intro is a little bit longer because the episode's a little bit shorter. But let's get into this 2013 deep cut vintage Wellness Wonderland radio conversation with my grandpa, who was a former college basketball coach, former voice of the MSU Spartans on the radio. He actually just stopped traveling with the team this year at 90 years old. He did it up until last year. And yeah, it's just a really special episode. My grandma, who was there during this episode, has since passed away. And you'll hear that the audio, like I said, it's it's not that great because I didn't even have a microphone back then. My voice is kind of annoyingly loud, louder than my grandpa's, especially at the beginning, but it, it should kind of even out. Shout out to my amazing friend, Clay, who is a guru on audio and helped me but there's there's some natural sound you're gonna hear the landline ringing at my grandparents house because duh they have a landline they're old (laughs) and i hope you enjoy it i love you guys thank you so much for listening every week this week happy holidays if you want to send me some love for the holidays the best way to do it is supporting the show so sharing it with a friend leaving a review on itunes you know you can donate There's also my gift guide if you guys haven't checked that out. And let's get right into this episode from 2013. I love you guys, and I'll I'll talk to you again at the end of this episode. Welcome back, everyone. Today is a very special edition of the Wellness Wonderland Radio because former college basketball coach and current voice of the Michigan State Spartans on the radio, Gus Ganakis, is here in Wonderland. I'm actually on location visiting him and his wife in their own version of Wellness Wonderland. Gus Ganakis is a World War II veteran, basketball coach, father of six, radio personality, and most importantly, grandfather. And he's also been one of my personal wellness inspirations since I was a kid, whether he knew it or not. So I am so excited for all of us to get inspired by his wisdom and have him share some of his wellness routines and insights with us today. So thank you so much for talking with me, Poppy. (laughs) So you're the grand child, right? I'm the grandchild. One of three, yeah, and we're very proud of you, Katie. Thank you for inviting me. Well, here we go. Okay, well, we've got a lot to talk about, so let's jump right in. Like I said, you live in your own version of the Wellness Wonderland, and my whole life, whether you knew this or not, you've really been an inspiration to me, and you've always exercised, right? So when did you start exercising as a kid? Was it something where you always active as a kid, and why do you make exercise such a priority in your life? Well, as a youngster, I was very athletically inclined, so I played sports, and uh, and, and that <clears throat> I really didn't think about it as being a fitness program, right. but just a, something I liked to do, and so that continued as I as I grew older. Then I think I was influenced by it when I was eighteen. I was in the United States Marine Corps for two years, and the Marine Corps is, is a organization that emphasizes fitness. And then the other thing was that I I wanted to coach. I knew I wanted to be a coach. And so when I came to Michigan State University, I 
uh, enrolled and, and majored in physical education. You know, there really wasn't a coaching curriculum, mm -hmm. but you, <clears throat> most people sought a physical education degree, which included uh, a lot of uh, courses involving the anatomy, physiology, and, and fitness. So that's perfect. That's what I wanted to talk about next. So let's give everybody a little bit of a background on who you are and like your your life is so interesting and I always love talking about this. So your parents came from Greece, right? And your father died when you were very, very young. So what are some lessons that you picked up um, growing up before you came to Michigan State? Well, my, my father, as you mentioned, came and my mother uh, came from Greece. And my father eventually, he came to this country when he was 14 years old. And uh, eventually he had a, he, he had a uh, store in which he, he uh, a restaurant, uh, 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 ice cream store, candy. He made his own ice cream. He made it, a lot of the candy. Uh, he was uh, often uh, the the person who cooked the meals, but then we got he got into the point where he hired chefs. But anyway, I, I, at that time too, I I became fitness conscious uh, because I knew that, particularly from the candy and the ice cream, that the, those things were very caloric and, right. and very fattening uh, things. So I uh, I kind of learned to. Be careful of eating uh, what we had in the store right. because it was very, uh, you know, very um, you want treats. It. Yeah, very but that's treats. the thing. That's the thing that I wanted to talk to you about because with those being treats, but like you said, they were homemade and they were made with love and they were made you know, not necessarily like today, a lot of those things have a lot of different ingredients and they're made in factories, but these were homemade, homemade. they were made, yes. you know, it's kind of like we've gone kind of away from that with, and people want to get back to a simpler way where things were homemade and that's kind of, do you kind of see that with like in your life, how it's gone from everything being homemade because that was the only way to things being more mass produced and then now they're kind of wanting to get back to homemade. Could you talk about that a little bit and how you've seen that? Well, you explained it very well. That, that, uh, at that time, yes, you did, everything was homemade and it was genuine and uh, whereas now things are more artificial. Right. And, uh, and, and don't taste as much well. <laughs> exactly. You can tell. You can right. tell, right? Right. So, all right, so then after that, you, I want to get a little bit into, so we talked a little bit about your childhood, but I want to get back to um, your time in World War II. I think that's really interesting, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience there and any positive things that ca came from that experience and your experience after the war. Well, uh, I was at the age... Uh right in the midst of the, right in the middle of World War II. But I had brothers, two older brothers that were in the service in the Army. And at that time, you know, when you reached 18 years old, you were drafted by the, by the service. And, uh, or you enlisted. And a friend of I, mine, uh, we decided that after graduation from high school, uh, we would enlist, in, we're going to enlist in the Marine Corps rather than being drafted into the Army. And, uh, uh, as, as you know, why did you want to do that? Well, I think it, it had a lot to do with patriotism. Uh, you had to do. You had to go anyway in, into the. You're going to be drafted into one of the armed right. forces, and uh, and at that time, you know, you you, you uh, uh, there was a lot of publicity about the Marine Corps, which, uh, which it gets now too as being the best fighting outfit in the, in the, in the world. And uh, it was just a, a matter of pride, you know. Yeah. You wanted to go to the to the, the for, uh, air for, uh, uh, the armed forces that that was the, supposed to be the best, but right. but they are. My my brothers uh, both were in, as I mentioned, in the, in the army. My one was in the infantry, fought on the on the uh, European battle, and it was in, participated in the invasion at Normandy, and and I actually got wounded, but. Uh, <clears throat> and my uh, my other brother was stayed in the states, and he was a mathematician, science person, and he would uh, they had him serve in uh, Bowdoin College in Maine at a at a atmospheric uh, 
station. Uh, and then uh, my friend and I, we just, you know, it was a matter of uh, pride and stuff. So we I joined. think it says a lot about your character, too, that you want it. It says a lot about your character that you wanted right. to do that. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to be in what we thought was the best. And, and then, you know, we're at a young age and, and going through boot camp at, uh, at Paris Island was pretty tough pretty tough uh, duty, you know, they, you really go in there and you call the boot, not a private or anything, or just a boot, <laughs> and uh, it, it was pretty tough, that's another place where I learned yeah, fitness in the Marine Corps, and uh, so that's uh, ended up in uh, uh, going to the Marine Corps, spent two years in the Marine Corps, and most of that time I spent overseas. Did, thinking back to that time, I know you were really excited when it was over, and this is like a perfect segue. So you got married to a very special lady named Ruth, and you moved to Michigan for college. And I love this story about how you got to come to Michigan and come to Michigan State. Could you talk a little bit about that and what brought you here? Yeah, my, I grew up in a town near Rochester, New York, Mount Morris, New York, and uh, and. It, after serving in the Marine Corps, I, uh, I, my mother, in the meantime, while I was in the Marine Corps, my mother moved to Michigan, uh, Scottville, Michigan. She had relatives there. She was a widow, and, uh, and she moved there while we were in, the three of us were in the service. And so when I got out of the Marine Corps, I uh, went, went to visit my mother and, and in Scottville, Michigan, and while I was there, my brother had already been uh, was out of the army then too, and he settled uh, in Ludington, which is adjacent to Scott Scottville, and uh, asked him about colleges because I was going to enroll in college somewhere. Now I never heard of Michigan State, and uh, I was at the time I was before I was uh, separated from Michigan uh, from the. Marine Corps, uh, I was in the St. Albans Naval Hospital, and they had a, uh, a department there that would help veterans that are getting, or, or uh, Marines that were going to get out of the service, and would help them in selecting a college or, or uh, in, uh, applying for college. And I, at that time, when I went back to the hospital, I I told the counselor that I had that I was interested in Ithaca College, which was near Mount Morris. Yeah, you know, we had uh, as a veteran, you had the uh, the bill. Of, I forgot what it was called, but uh, it was a school that uh, that John Hanna had a vision that it would could grow and and which it has immensely. And uh, our first. We, when we, Ruth and I w were married, and it was my high school sweetheart. And high school and kindergarten sweetheart. Yeah, <laughs> we knew each other for a long time. Met in kindergarten, right? What? Met in kindergarten, right? Yeah, well, I got, got to know her in kindergarten, but she, she, her family lived not far, far from where I live. And uh, I didn't... I just knew the, g the girls were my sisters. I had two yeah. sisters. I didn't know there were other girls. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we uh, then I, I when we I got the, to Michigan State as a student, we lived in the trailer camp area, and and enjoyed the the the, the opportunity to to get an education, which I was going to do one way or another. Right. I mean, that's a, I uh, wanted to be a coach and. But, uh, so I was happy that. Uh, so you always knew you wanted to be a coach, right? Yeah. You knew. When did you think you well, knew that? Well, I think uh, my well, when I was a freshman in high school. You know, I played in all the sports and I. And Talk. We, what were some remember, of those sports? Uh, well, I was a soccer, basketball, baseball player. Wow. And um, I remember when in, uh, in one of the classes I took as a freshman. Uh, I mean, a first year uh, student at yeah. uh, in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. That we had to do a a vocation 
project or what do you want it to be? Oh, cool. And, and that's that's the one I picked and you know, that, at that time and, and then it materialized. That's pretty cool because a lot of people, you know, take those things and then they do something completely different or they have something they want to be as a kid because pr pretty much ninth grade, you're still a kid. Right. And then they completely do something different or someone tells them they'd be good at something different. But you really stuck to that and said, right. I'm going to be a coach. I want to be a coach, and you did it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I, I yeah, it sure it. is. <laughs> After you went to college and played sports and knew you wanted to be a coach, what could you talk about actually coaching a little bit? Why did you want to do it? What were some of your favorite parts of it? Why is it a career that you wanted to do? And then when you started to do it, what did you like about it? Well, I was in the midst of it, uh, athletics, first of all, right. as a participant. And, uh, and the the first uh, coach I ran into was a, a, a high school or high school coach. Mark Meck was his name. But then this is interesting uh, because it was the way uh, that of the life of people that, that lived during the period of time of the World War II. Uh, you know, like families like my, my family got broke up quite a bit mm -hmm. from uh, because of the war. Uh, because the brothers, the three three boys, uh, all were in the service, and my mother, who became a widow, uh, it, 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 it interfered with with the progress we were making uh, in our hometown. So after we came back, you know, we just spread out because my mother had moved. Well, anyway, the um, we. Um, uh, I lost my chain of thought there. Well, you were saying just about how um, everybody moved around after the war and you were coaching yeah, and you had coaching, that coach right. that... So I was, this is interesting, because uh, when I was a, uh, a junior in high school, our coach, Coach Mack, he, he entered the service. Oh. He joined the Navy. I mean, he was... So what did uh, you have to do, coach the team? He was, a, you know, he was a man of about... Early, early 30s, yeah. you know, and he, he, and, uh, he ha hadn't yet got in this, uh, been he called up right. because of maybe because he was working in a school system or something and was married, but then he joined the Navy. So we were without a coach, but he made an impression on me. Anyway. So who coached the team at that time? Did you well, have to kind of step well, up? Well, we got uh, the commercial teacher. <laughs> the what? The, the com our teacher that taught commercial uh, oh, subjects, yeah. you know, like typing and yeah. stuff. He became the assigned coach, but he didn't not have any so background, uh, not even as an athlete, but he's more like a supervisor. Yeah. But we you had, did your own thing. Uh, but we did our own thing, and we had a lot of success uh, in, in, in the in the. Uh, uh, junior years and uh, senior year, I was in high school. In fact, our basketball team won the first county t uh, title that the school ever oh, wow. won. Pretty much coaching yourselves. Pretty much coach ourselves. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So did you, at that point, so that, did you kind of step yeah. up? Were you like a captain yeah, or something? Yeah, I was captain of the team. Oh, man. I didn't of, know that. A lot of the, uh, you know, the coaching part. So... That had an impression on me, yeah. so I knew pretty well. You knew you could kind of do it. Right. Nice. So then so then, when you actually started coaching, what were some of your favorite parts about it, and what were some challenges of being a coach that were hard for you? Well, it was uh, the, <clears throat> after I graduated from Michigan State, first of all, it was kind of difficult to get a job uh, because... Much uh, like now. <laughs> just like now, really, because... Uh, a lot of people coming back from the service and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I, um, I finally got a job. In order to get a coaching job, uh, and you would coach, but you got, really got the job because you also could teach a particular subject matter and coach mm -hmm. in, in the secondary school. So I had uh, minors in, in my academic career at Michigan State. I, I majored in physical education, but I, I uh, had several minors, and one of which was mathematics. And so I, I eventually, my first job was actually not a coaching job. It was mm -hmm. teaching uh, mathematics and actually some social study classes at Olivet, Michigan, and oh, Olivet I didn't know that. High School. And uh, the... Uh, and then, but I was still seeking a job in coaching. Mm -hmm. 
and I finally got uh, the job at East Lansing High School as an assistant coach in both in football and basketball. And uh, that's, that's, that's where it all started. And then after the first year that I was uh, coaching in East Lansing, I became the head basketball coach. And you had a lot of success with that. So what were your favorite, what were some of your favorite parts of like actually being the coach and being like, you kind of have to be a motivator to people. You kind of have to be this figure that people can come to and ask questions to, but also you've got to be tough on them too and like kind of push them. So how did you find that balance? Well, you know, you were a teacher too. That's a, right. that's a nice thing about it. You, you coach and taught. Now that, you know, a lot of high school coaches are just, do some other job, had some other job, and co- and are not in the educational scheme of things. That academic phase of our job, yeah. we, we were both certainly we put more a lot more emphasis right. on on the, on the coaching school end, before but athletics. The job of being a a teacher had a lot of a a, a lot of a effect on you. I mean, you mm-hmm. had to prepare. You had to. And you got students that aren't athletes, and I, I enjoy that part. But uh, yeah. teaching in the classroom, I think it had a lot to do with, uh, as you're really pointing out, formulating your values and uh, discipline yeah. and and, uh, and preparation uh, for your coaching. So it, it it really was a long long day for a, yeah. a secondary uh, uh, school co- coach and teacher. Yeah. And, Whereas now, as I mentioned, in a lot of places, they just come in. They just coach. come in to coach. Period. So when you got to the college level, when you're coaching at the college level, you were no longer a teacher. You were just like you were saying. You were just the coach. That was your primary job. So how did you? What were some lessons of like actually being a coach and and pushing your team and getting them to the next level and motivating them but not being too hard on them? What was like? What was your (laughs) kind of strategy there? there? There's a half a medium there in the disciplinary and part of it, but in uh, I never had a lot of problems with the discipline of players and uh, it it it, it just uh, you got to balance it. It, Coaching is is is, uh, diversified. I mean, you got to be, uh, there's the the organization of, of the, the sport you're coaching. For example, basketball. You got to be learned in it. You have to have a background in it. You have to uh, teach players uh, the fundamentals of the physical skills involved. But there's also emotion involved. There's uh, attitude, and it, it's always a, a, a big part of it. So I, I think that just comes from the day to day to day you're in the company of your players and you're and you're uh, trying to instill in them some of the things that are important but it's also physical training you know right. you've you got to train them you got to you've got to get a system into play and you got to have a, a camaraderie and there, there, there's a there's a team. lot of teaching team right and it's like um, Michael Jordan said there's no there's no I in team as somebody then said yes, but there is one. It, it, there is an I and win. <laughs> so there's. So thinking about the the team, you mentioned that there's emotional aspects and attitude is important in basketball. Why is attitude so important in basketball or a team sport? Well, first of all, do you got a, a sport where you have to have some individual prowess? You have to be pretty well coordinated. You're going to handle the basketball. There's all that the fundamentals mm-hmm. involved in the handling the basketball. But you're going to be without the basketball for long periods of time. Oh, I never thought in about a basketball it like that. Right. Game. You know, you got to you got to play defense. You got to be uh, doing things uh, without the ball to help someone else uh, attack the basket or score. So uh, there's a there's a lot of sharing involved, and, and uh, 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 there's a great deal of. Uh, uh, camaraderie and uh, teamwork and uh, it's a it's a that's what's great about basketball there has to be an integration of individual skills and group group skill thinking about that a little bit with I want to talk about just a certain aspect of the game which always gets my mind working so when you're shooting three throws right did you ever talk to people about how what they should think before they go to shoot those shots well, Did you have any advice that you would throw, give them? Yeah. Like emotionally? <laughs> yeah, with free throws, it's uh, it's something that you have to, first of all, 
practice it. You have to have a method, a fundamental method mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, executing the shot. But you have to have some uh, mental, uh, mental, mental portion of it. You got to have some confidence. But it, free throw shooting is, uh, and all shooting in basketball, it, 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 <clears throat> it's a skill that players individually develop through a long period of time. And it's coupled with their physical, their coordination. It's hard for someone who, who uh, to just become a shooter mm -hmm. <clears throat> by practicing and practicing and practicing in, in a short period of time. The people who are good shooters are, and the best free throwers are the good shooters. Yeah. And uh, uh, the ones that are the good shooters are the ones that started, started in very young and were and trained properly over a long period of time. But when you come to the point that where you get into high school, and participate, or even college, a lot of college players are not very good shooters, and it's very difficult for them to become a shooter because there's an integration of the physical skill of it yeah. and, and then all the years of practice leading up to that. That's interesting. So it's something that you re of skill you really have to foster. Right. After your time as a coach and kind of bringing people up to the present, so now you're a broadcaster for the team, right? And you travel with the team and you do lots of interviews just like I'm doing right here. Again, something that you have been a huge inspiration for me for and kind of teaching me how to do this. So how did you prepare yourself for that role? And currently, I kind of know this, I know you watch a lot of games, but how do you prepare yourself to like emotionally and mentally when you're going into the game to know what you're doing and, and really like be present there to say such great things on the radio? Well, it's a you know it's pretty it's not an easy transition right. for a coach to go into sports broadcasting, but it's still something that is kind of natural in a way because you've always been uh, you know the game and you know the right. game and you and you you got a feel for everything and and um, so it was it's something that people want. To, Want you want someone who has a, a, a background in, in athletics, and uh, and I had a you know a, a reputable uh, s uh, name, and and so it's you know when you're when you're doing it like I am as a as kind of an analyst, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not a, I'm not really the play by play man. I have a lot of respect for people that are like Will Teeman, for whom I work. And, uh, and others, George Blaha, uh, and that, that's something I, I could never do because that really requires a, a very quick mind as far as uh, remembering things and names. And, and uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another thing when, in doing this in basketball. Or, you got to, you got to, in football too, but in football, they get, they've got a lot of people helping them on a number of names of people. In basketball, fortunately, there's only five players on the court at one time and 10, I mean, 10 with the other team, but you have to, you know, you have to become accustomed to, to their names. The main thing is a, a coach has a background already right, to, right. to, uh, analyze things and, and present it and from a from a coach's st standpoint so it, it's an easy transition really so when you got started with this right how many years ago was that how long have you been doing no, the radio? I don't know. i'm pretty close at getting in there around 30 years well, I'm, I'm older than me over 25 <laughs> man um okay so you've been doing this for longer than my lifetime so you're gonna have to think back here but when you first started this you're like okay i'm gonna be on the radio like were you nervous were you excited what what did you feel no, i think i met? get more nervous now than i did year, years ago when i first started. really yeah i think I, then you're younger and you're and you're uh, you know you feel you're very confident of yourself and and nowadays uh you know i feel i feel uh uh, I have to prepare more thoroughly, and uh, I don't trust my memory as much. But you're and, with it. You got and, it. You know, you do such and, a good uh, job. And, uh, it's just, uh, and I think what happens to me, it's, uh, I get nervous at, at the game, almost like I was coaching the team, yeah. you know. But uh, I've had the advantage of working with a great coach and Tom Izzo, and he's had some terrific assistant coaches, and they've been very, very uh 
kind to me and, you know, make it a lot easier. I can get information from them. Yeah. But I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm coaching the team sometimes <laughs> as far as, as far as before the game starts. I get, mm-hmm. I get very nervous about it. Not about being in, in front of the mic, more about the game itself, the surrounding conditions. Oh, that's really then, cool. Yeah. I never knew that. So do you, do you remember, though, that first day when you were going to get started on the radio? I mean, I'm sure you've watched technology change a ton. Yeah, but I, at first, like I say, I'm more nervous now than That's I so was funny. Uh, years ago because I think you see the implications and the importance of it. And, of course, sports have become uh, so widely popular right. that you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with people who are listening. You're dealing with uh, people that uh, are at the game. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of pressure, much more pressure, competitive pressure, in sports now, as, yeah. as everybody knows, uh, because of the of media exposure. And uh, so we that are in broadcasting, kind of, we feel that some, not as much as the coaches, right. but we feel it. For me, I mean, I think being a coach is really cool and, like, really great, but, like, I think being a broadcaster is, like, so cool and so great, and I've always loved that you've done that my whole life. But for you, you said you wanted to be a coach for a really long time. What, what about getting into broadcast? Was that something you had kind of an aspiration for? It just kind of happened. No, I never had an aspiration for it, but it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a pretty convenient step because you already have some public awareness or, mm-hmm. and uh, and... And it, you're still in the sport, right? And but you're not coaching it, but you're in it, and uh, so it was a pretty easy transition to make. Oh, that's kind of cool for me. So this this is a cool way to you know in that saying everything happens for a reason, right? It's kind of cool for you to see in your life that you know you started out as a coach and maybe you never wanted to do broadcasting necessarily, but you were really positioned in a great way to do it, and then now you love it. And so it kind of shows that you know you had to do the coaching to be able to do this. You couldn't really just go into this, and it's really cool to kind of see that happen in your life, yeah, right? Kind of mirrored, you know. It, exactly. It's, uh, it's a public. It's a job where you're in the in the public, like coaching. And uh, it's it's just uh, something that uh, you'd like to stay in it. If you're not coaching, then you'd like to stay in the athletic uh, scene, and and so this is a good way. You and you see it extensively mm-hmm. now. Coaches going in, from college coaches going into broadcasting. Broadcast. And, For you, with with this, you've mentioned this a couple of times. Like you're kind of. A public figure you know a lot of people know you every time I go anywhere with you like everybody knows you and you really have to like position yourself in that way because you're on the radio and you're coaching what advice do you have people who do put themselves out there in a way that you are kind of a public figure and what advice do you have for them to just make sure that they present themselves in a good way Katie, you'll do fine. <laughs> and, and, uh, I think it's it's just something you wouldn't you really wouldn't be doing it. You wouldn't be uh, chosen to do right. it unless you were a person that had the skills and also the the, the way you look, the way you act that uh, seek you out. And uh, and so I, I think the transition is just automatic. It's happened happens so much now. But are you conscious of, you know, when, when you go out, you'll pro- people will probably know you, so you make sure that you look nice and you make sure that you are, are you know, you're always so kind to everybody you meet because there's so many people who come up to you. You probably don't know who they are, but you're always so kind to people. Yeah. Is that something that you would, you know, advise people to do is just to everyone they meet, putting out that same level of kindness? Because I see you, like, implement that in your life. Yeah, you have to be congenial, of course. And, uh, yeah, I like that portion a lot. You know, to to see people, and maybe you don't, you know, you don't know them, but they know you, and then, but then you're, but with me, I like to meet, I like to see meet them, I like to know what their names yeah. are, I like, not just a passing by saying right. hello. You and know, you I always think that's a very take the time. Ingredient. And, and you I all- think that helps me a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think I'm the, uh, you know, I'm not a George Blaha or I'm a Will Teeman or or I'm not, <clears throat> you know, it's not my. It's not my forte, but I have. I think your personality is 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 a one that's going to be very important to It'll take you as far. you meet people and, and and not just say hello and pass them by. You know, just 
give them a feel, you know, a vibration that, hey, I'd like, I'd like to know about you. Being present, giving them eye contact, and actually right. asking them questions. I think, I think that's huge because, you know, I mean, you mentioned those names. The people who are listening to this, they're not going to know their names. They're going to no. know your name, right? And so the thing, like, whoever you are, whatever you do, whether you're a public figure or not, like, taking the time to actually have a conversation with someone, ask them a question about them and whoever right. they are, being kind to them, no matter if you know who they are or you don't, but actually taking the time to be present with them, give them eye contact and instead of, because we all know those people where you, they talk to you and they're looking around the room for someone else to talk to, right? You know, that doesn't feel good to anybody. And I just, I always admire you for teaching me to really spend time with whoever is talking with yeah, you, you know? You know what? You got it. <laughs> well, thank you. You taught me well. We kind of already talked about this, but you're one of the best public speakers that I've ever seen in my life. And you always have a joke or a comedy every time I hear you speak, right? So why is making it fun, smiling, telling a joke, or... Well, I think, you know, humor is, is really a, a great uh, ingredient to have, you know. And, you know, we want to smile, want to laugh. Captures so, their you know, attention. Problem with that with me now, because I'm i got so many years on it. I'm running out of material. <laughs> it's okay. I think they're I, always I, funny. I, I like to, I like that speech. You know, we were involved as a coach. You speak at functions. Right, yeah. As a, lot, a, as a I, coach, you're a public speaker to yeah, the team right, every day. Right, and it, it, I think uh, humor is so valuable, not only in, uh, with with uh, audiences, but it's, it's so valuable as far as a coach with his players and to have some humor. It isn't all, you know, uh, slave driving. Right. I never thought about that. So that's something you brought into your coaching as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. I never would have thought, I would have thought that your coaching was all serious, all pushing them. I never would have thought that you, you know, tried to make it fun, like at that level, but you'd say you did. Oh, I think coaches, uh, when, you know, you got to remember that how it coaching a football team or basketball team you're around those players for yeah. you know two three hours a day you know for several days and weeks months you've got to make so it you, fun yeah you got to make it uh, you can't be a slave driver you know just uh, it's uh i think humor is very valuable and i think the, the great coaches all have some humor Oh, that's interesting. And it's like, well, it's like with any form of exercise, you know, the people on the team will hate coming to practice and they'll hate playing the game if the, if the coach is that much of a slave driver, right? And it's like with any exercise, I always tell this to people who listen to the podcast and read the blog, you know, if you don't like your exercise routine, you're not going to do it. So do something that's fun and that you enjoy. And same thing with meditation or yoga or food. You know, if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. So you want to make sure it's something that you like and you enjoy. So I think that's something that people can kind of take away from this conversation is that bringing in humor into your life, into your team, into your family, bringing, keeping it light, keeping it fun and enjoyable for whatever routine of wellness that you do is really crucial, right? right? Yeah, you know, there's there's a <clears throat> a combination that has to exist, and it's a, in sports. It's a, there's a self expression, and then there's a, the discipline part of it. You know, adhering to rules, regulations, uh, but there's also a part where the the individual had there has to be some self expression. You can't destroy that. But I think that basketball is a sport that does both. You know, there's the there's <clears throat> there's the uh, uh, routine of practicing certain things and 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 doing uh, drills and and then executing plays in, in relation to you and your and your teammates. But then there's also has to be a period of time where you do have some self-expression that you don't completely dominate the person yeah. with the discipline. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to keep, you've got to, whatever you do, you've got to keep that aspect of yourself part of it. Whether you're an artist or you're a basketball player or a broadcaster, you know, you've got to, even though you are part of a team, you've got to keep that. Yeah. I the, like that. Yeah, that. It's a balance between regist- uh, uh, regimentation. Mm-hmm. Like the certain sports are more regimented, They're like football. You know, you got plays. Every you go here, you baseball. If the uh, if the balls hit to the third baseman, uh, grounder, he's got to throw it over to the first base. He, you know, that's 
that's going over my head here with the sports. Right? But but it, it, there has to be a, a, a balance there. Yeah. And with balance, basketball gives you that some. There's regimentation, plays, and organization, but there has to be some room there for self-expression, which there in basketball is constant. That a person's individual ability has to emerge. Well, I mean, for me, what I'm hearing here, you know, like. I like basketball. It's probably the, the other sports kind of went over my head. But the what you said there about self-expression and just in life, you know, everybody's right. got to have their own self-expression. And I think that's another really great takeaway that people can get from this conversation is that, you know, in life, it's, it's good to learn things. It's good to be in school. It's good to pick up things from just living life in your job, but also keeping with who you really are and expression, expressing yourself, I think, is really important. Yeah, that's so, so vital. And, right? Yeah. You know, and sports teach that. You know, exactly. They teach teamwork, but there's always the individual part of it, too. I love that. All right, so now I want to get personal with you a little bit and ask you some personal questions. You ready for it? Mm-hmm. Okay. You, we talk a lot about routines in the Wellness Wonderland Radio and why routines are so important for us as humans and just in our lives. So you have an exercise routine and things that you've done to fit exercise into you, your life at every single point in your life, and you usually do that in the morning. So could you talk to us a little bit about your morning routines and why what you do in the morning is important for how the rest of your day goes? Well, it used to be, now it's more mainly in the morning, middle of the morning, but it used to be after practice, I, uh, and I, as far as, I was one time a jogger, and uh that was my physical fitness program, pretty much. How but far would you run? How far? Mm-hmm. Not far. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just would maybe go, you know, a mile, two miles every once in a while, but very slowly. And uh, and, I, and then I would, I remember doing that with Coach John Bennington. I was assistant to John Bennington at Michigan State for three years, and we always uh, found time at noon. Nice. Sometimes after practice to, to jog in Jenison Fieldhouse. There are a lot of joggers through the years. They still do it there, I'm sure. And now my routine is uh, I, I work out at home. I don't jog anymore. Nordic track mm-hmm. equipment in the basement yeah. and, a, and a, a stationary bicycle. And th- those are my vehicles for workout. If I, if I miss a workout, I feel like I'm... I, I, uh, I just don't, I don't, it doesn't, uh, I need to get the workout, the stimulation of my, my body. My routine in the morning is to, I like to read the papers. I have coffee and, and read the papers, and hopefully the schedule will allow me afterwards to <clears throat> ease into the, the Nordic yeah. track and go in the basement and do that with the bicycle. And uh, if that's my routine, but but because of your schedule, you you, you miss flexible. It. Yeah, it that it doesn't uh, doesn't always work out that way. You know, you might you have some something you have to do like this maybe. <laughs> oh no! Did you not get to work out today? <laughs> no, I worked out. Before. Oh good, thank goodness. But well, one of my favorite quotes from somebody is, "Movement in your body creates movement in your mind." And they say that you're clearer when you are exercising and you're clearer when you're doing those things you need to do and you're easing into the day because it's so easy for us to just wake up, rush out the door when you're in a rush and obviously that that doesn't feel great. So for you, it's something that you've really, that I've seen that you've always, you know, whenever I spend the night, you always wake up, take your time in the morning. It's kind of a a nice way to ease into your day and and not going into the day with that rushed, frantic sense because that kind of makes the whole day in that rush frantic state. Yeah, I, I like I like that, that I like expression. That. It eases into Ease my day. Ease into the I day. Like that. I yeah. like when I have commitments, uh, of course I'm retired, so it, it, it's easier for me to You're a busy it. guy. But uh, like you get commitments, you got doctor appointment or someone in your family. Granddaughter family. wants to interview yeah, you. And, and I hate it when the, <laughs> when the, when the uh, appointments, like for medical reasons, are in the morning. In the you morning. Know, I like to have, well, late morning. I like late morning for that. But if it's like in mid morning or early morning, cuts off your routine ruins, the whole yeah, day. It breaks, breaks, it ruins the day. We talk a lot about morning routines and how important they are. It's like one of my big things I talk about on the blog. And little did you know, you inspired me for that 
switching that up, another really important thing for me and a really important thing for all the people that listen to the Wellness Wonderland radio is relaxing and routines in the evening before you go to sleep. So what are some things that you do in the evening before you go to sleep? You know, washing your face, getting ready for bed. What do you do to wind down to really make sure you have a good night's sleep? Well, that's a good point. Uh... That, that uh, sometimes when you get older, it's a little difficult to get to sleep. So that I, I've noticed that re- uh, recently. But my routine is to, uh, you know, have, have the, have the family have a dinner, and then uh, maybe a little television news or a sporting event. Wheel of Fortune, sometimes. Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> <laughs> right? And and, uh, and then uh, I'd like to read things. I like I, I read papers but I like to read magazines. I sometimes I get a book a good book to read and so Or sometimes a, your granddaughter gives you a book you've already read for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think uh, that that helps me a lot in 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 getting uh, that when I go to bed I'll, I'll fall asleep more readily. And then your iPhone, you know, you get I I recently I've been doing look, reading the with in bed with the iPhone, find a couple things from a sports standpoint, and and, uh, and easy we, to get caught up on that though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I wait, I wait for that really to make me more drowsy. I got you know routine, go to bed around eleven o'clock. And you're always really mindful of how you take care of yourself and your skin. Can you talk about that? You always are, you know, you're conscious of washing your face, getting your pajamas on, and going to sleep, and really like taking care of yourself like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a cleanliness guy. Yeah, yeah I do. And you take your time in the morning, in the morning and that and yeah. that that grooming's important to how right. you feel and. Right. You know, like we said before, you're seeing a lot of people. You got to take care of yourself, and you always really are mindful of that. Yeah, those are all things you you got to do. Right. So at this point, I want to know. So I'm 23 years old. No secret, I'm your granddaughter. What advice would you give to your 23 year old self? Or you know, you've been on this world for a long time. You've done a lot of things, learned a lot of things. What advice would you give to 23-year-olds? Or a lot of young people listen to this podcast. So what advice would you give to young people? Hang in there. I know it's difficult, this is kind of era that we're in, you know, particularly job-seeking for that age or any age now. And just got to hang in there. It's just a matter of, you know, continue to be one that keeps abreast of th- things and try to... Take advantage of what skills you have and what background you have. What well, what advice would you give them for staying well and keeping up with um, taking care of themselves, even though times can be you know rushing and having to move so fast and every you know you can get everything on your phone, everything so fast. What advice do you have for slowing down and, and keeping like simpler times from when you were younger and how things were then? Well, I think it's more difficult now mm-hmm. for people. Uh, than we had when I was younger. Uh, in fact, you sought, you know, you sought things to do, but they weren't complicated, and it's more from a friendship standpoint. I think it, it's important to, uh, to interact with your friends and. Uh, in person. In person, yeah, and and as you were talking, uh, you know, prepare yourself and uh, your hygiene, your, uh, and, and try to. Try to know where, where your strengths are and exploit that. Mm, I like that. Know where your strengths are. This is the last big question I want to ask you, and it's a big one. So the name of my blog and this podcast, as you know, I ask this to everybody, is the last question, is the wellness wonderland, right? So when I offer that term to you, what comes up? What does living in your state of the wellness wonderland mean to you? Well, I, I, I think the word health is, is, is a expansive, more than just, you know, that you're physically healthy, mentally healthy, but like we've been talking about, that, that have a routine for exercise. And we're just, we were talking earlier before we started this. I'm, I'm just learning at my old age to get up, when you get up, mm-hmm. you know, I always have a cup of coffee and... And read the papers, but I, I've never been uh, routinely drinking water. You know, I just uh, 
until now. <laughs> until now, yeah. So I think, you know, get habits like that that are helpful. Like drinking right? it first. We'll tell everybody the habit I, you're going to start tomorrow, right? Drinking a cup of water first thing in the morning, get it done, and at least you've had one, right? Right. At least, you know, you said, what is years, I've, I remember years ago, like you mentioned it today, you got to drink eight cup, uh, glasses of water mm -hmm. a day. Well, I never adhered to that. I always thought you got... Water came with everything. It's in your coffee and uh, I, I, your drinks, whatever you drink. Yeah. <clears throat> but I find that now that's very vital. I've had friends of mine say, hey, you gotta got to drink water. But I never... Friends? How about your granddaughter? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, those little health things that come up that you present in your shows and stuff. Those little uh, things to do you got to adapt Practices. that in your routine. Mm -hmm. it isn't, you can't say that, oh, I don't have time for it. I don't have time. But you got to yes. find time. Exactly, because it's important. It to, yeah, it has, it you has, can't give to other people. You can't give in your job or your life if you don't give to yourself. To yourself. It doesn't cost anything. Exactly. <laughs> There's so many things like that that you could do, like, you're, like we're talking yes. about exercise. You can go out and walk. Jumping jacks. Run. It doesn't, doesn't cost anything, and they're so valuable. Yoga, exactly. What about um, for you, when I say Wellness Wonderland, anything else that comes up there? Or should we move on to the quick-fire questions? Well, the only thing that comes to my mind is my granddaughter, Katie. Is, <laughs> is, uh, that's her theme. And, and that, <laughs> it, it, it's a very good that's one. her thing. <laughs> Well, you live in a wellness wonderland too, and so and anybody can. Wellness wonderland, what I always say, is just a state of mind. It's not a place that you are. It's just having that positive outlook on things. Now let's move into quick fire questions. Ready? You're a little nervous for these. These are, this will be fun. So, what is your favorite color? Blue. Favorite day of the week. Saturday. Favorite hour of the day. <clears throat> Wake up. Wake up! I was gonna. I thought the. I thought you'd say the morning. Favorite vegetable? None. None. Come <laughs> no, on, you gotta that. say one. Uh, bean. Bean. Favorite fruit? Banana. Favorite way to relax? What would your favorite meal you've eaten recently be? Favorite what? Meal you've eaten recently. I still don't get it. Meal like. Oh, meal. Yeah. My favorite meal is mm -hmm. spaghetti. Spaghetti. What superhero power, if you could have any superhero power, like being invisible or flying, if you could have any superhero power for a day, which one would you have? Superpower? Yeah, superpower. Like you could read extra fast, you could fly, or you could, you know, I don't know, whatever you come up with. What's your favorite? I, I really don't have any. you got to pick one. Would you like to fly? Would you like to x-ray vision? Would you like to see the future? What would be the coolest thing for you? Flying would be pretty cool. Flying? Yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> You're not into that. You don't want to see for your body. You like, you like yeah, how things I, are. I, I, I like to do well what God gave me. Oh, that's a good one. Everybody picks something. So this is the first time no one's picked anything. I like that. Favorite season? Spring. Me too. Spring's a good one. Because my birthday is because I was born in the spring. April. <laughs> Favorite sport? Baseball. Baseball. Wow. Favorite sport to play? Baseball. Baseball. Wow. The basketball coach's favorite sport is baseball. Favorite basketball team? Michigan State. Favorite basketball position? Point guard. Why? Well, it's a, 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 sport, uh, it's a position where you have to have physical skills, but also you know, leadership, leadership ability unselfishness nice best advice that you've ever given or received you gave a great one that I think just about being yourself and finding yeah. your individuality advice I would give someone mm -hmm. well I think with that is the one is a, be yourself and, and then well no I'd say know yourself and then and then uh, develop maintain those skills and develop it I like that. And the last question I have for you, favorite grandchild? 
<laughs> you don't have to I answer that one. Them, right? You don't have all, to answer that all one. Favorites, the trio. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Poppy, for coming on the uh, show. And thank, why don't you thank everybody for listening? Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Yay. All right. Well, we will be back next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Well, there you have it. That was my conversation with my grandpa. I definitely want to do an update to this. Hopefully, I'll get to spend some time with him over the holidays. I want to ask him more about what it was like growing up, more about just different decades, I think. I want to know what it was like living in the 60s and the 70s. And Anyway, if you guys have questions for the Gus Kanakis, send them my way, and I will ask. I love you guys. Thank you again so much for listening. If you are still listening right now, I really am liking this emoji thing. It's like this little family. Um, Speaking of family, the Facebook group is the best place for that. So join the Facebook group if you haven't already. Leave a review, sign up for the email list, all of the things. I, I love you guys. Okay, the emoji. Let's just go ahead and do the Christmas tree. It's Christmas time, so send me the Christmas tree. You can put it on Twitter. You can put it on Instagram. Just tag me with the Christmas tree to let me know that you are still listening right now to me rambling. And that's really it. I love you guys. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. And I'll talk to you guys before the new year next week. Love you. Bye.